Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I welcome you to Glendale Heights United Methodist Church this morning, this 11th Sunday after Pentecost. Um, a special welcome to those who are joining us uh, through Facebook Live. And please let us know that you're there. Enter a comment. Um, tell us, hey, that you're doing okay this morning. And let us know what your prayer requests are. Um, would like to remind you of some opportunities for discipleship that are coming up this week. Um, uh, tonight, anyway, our last uh, Bible study of the, the series on um, radical discipleship in the book of Mark is tonight at 5.30, and this week we're, we're meeting at Epworth. And um, this will be our last one for the summer, and I'll let you know what, what's up for the fall. Um, and again, um, keep Brogdon in your mind um, as we've entered into the agreement to uh, help support their food pantry and clothes closet and to help them out with school supplies. And we'll take either um, the stuff that you shop for yourself or we'll uh, take your financial donations and um, Cynthia Werner will do the shopping for you. And we, we'd love to be able to take um, a nice big box full of stuff over there to them for the beginning of their school year. Uh, last week, uh, last Sunday, the council did vote to make uh, masking optional. Um, and of course, the, the CDC guidelines also are relaxed about um, social distancing now. And there in your bulletin, there's some general guidelines. But for, for the, the details, I, I do invite you to go to the cdc.gov website um, where you get all the timing about um, isolation, what day to test on, and all that kind of stuff. And uh, while masking is optional, we do ask that you respect those who uh, choose to continue masking and distancing. We all have our, our reasons um, for the choices that we make. So I um, hope that this isn't any, anything onerous uh, for anyone. Are there uh, any other announcements Pardon? PPRC meeting. Uh, PPRC meeting this afternoon. Um, we'll finish working on the State of the Church report. It's at, uh, here at, at 4 o'clock. Anything else? Okay. Well, I invite you to sit comfortably and in an open and upright posture with your feet on the floor, maybe you want to open your hands in a, in a posture of receptivity. I invite you to breathe deeply all the way to the very tips of your lungs. And empty your hearts and minds of distracting thoughts and feelings. And begin opening yourself to receive God's healing touch through our worship service this morning.
I invite you to please rise in body or in spirit and let's join together in our call to worship number 2031. <laughs> delight. You work vindication and justice for all who are oppressed, and through your Son, Jesus, you make your ways known to us. In this hour, awaken us to your presence and your transforming love, so that by our healing and redemption we may give glory to you and participate in the healing and redemption of your creation. These things we pray through Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now let us join our voices in praise as we sing together number 90.
be seated. It is a gift to be able to speak directly to God, to share with God our joys and our concerns, and we, we do so now, uh, at this time in our service. We want to uh, remember this morning um, Dee Tucker, who continues to uh, recover from her accident where she hurt her knee, um, but she is getting around well with a walker, and the swelling's going down, all that good stuff, and of course her family is taking real good care of her, so we give thanks to God uh, that she is well on her way to recovery. Um, last Sunday, we lifted up prayers for, for Jean Lorenzo, who we thought was going in this past Wednesday for a procedure, but that it was postponed to this coming Wednesday, so please uh, continue to hold Jean and her family in your prayers as she undergoes a, a procedure this week. Other joys or concerns. Um, let's not forget the, the Werners this morning who had a COVID exposure. Um, little Aiden got sick and they were taking care of him this week. So um, prayers that they don't get sick. No, they are sick, tested positive for COVID and they're coming. Okay, so they, since yesterday they've tested positive. So prayers for them. Okay, so prayers for a member of our online congregation whose parents are dealing with health issues. Ms. Wells. Prayers for our country. Yes, we are. Uh, very glad to have Ann Wells with us this morning. Uh, what did she say, a 34 year member of First Carry and has um, been living in Durham for a while now and is looking for a local church. So we're glad to have you with us this morning. David? Understand. Well, we wish you uh, safe travels and uh, a wonderful family celebration on your honeymoon, and um, we'll, we'll pray for healing for Van, that maybe between now and then, the uh, time he visits with his oncologist, that those spots will just be gone. I saw some other hands. Here we go. Prayers for Terry Blaylock, who's having open heart surgery. Leonard? Uh, prayers for um, Kevin and Mercy for Princess as she returns back to Denise Freetown on Wednesday. She'll be arriving here on Thursday morning. It's a long 10 hour, 10 and a half hour flight to make up my track to um, New York. Okay, thank you for sharing that, Leonard. Um, Traveling Mercies for Princess, who is returning from Freetown, Sierra Leone, on uh, Wednesday, getting back uh, here on Thursday. And then this, uh, the 26th of this month is the ninth anniversary of your father's passing. Nathaniel, is that right? Okay, 
birthday, so birthday wishes for Princess on that on that same day. And um, Nathaniel will be sitting with the saints of light and looking down, celebrating with you. Diane. Sorry. Your your grandson. One year anniversary. <coughs> so that was um, Diane asking for prayers for the family of Gerald Duncan, an old family friend uh, who passed away, and also um, we remember Diane and her daughter and their family uh, on the loss of their baby one year ago. Other joys or concerns? Well, let us go to God in prayer. Loving God, you are our hope and trust and the source of all compassion. You hear the cries of those in need, and you notice needs that we overlook. All around us, there are people bowed down under the hardships of oppressive, inequitable systems that perpetuate the flourishing of few at the expense of many. Open our eyes to the ways that we are complicit in such injustice, and help us to comprehend and participate in your life-giving ways of liberation. When we feel powerless and hopeless to effect change in systems, help us to see the one in front of us that we can be present to with compassion. So we pray today for those who are in need of your healing touch and of your compassion. We pray for those in our congregation who are recovering from injuries and illnesses, and we pray for those who await diagnoses and treatment. We pray for those who are mourning, um, remembering past losses. And we pray for those who are mourning today um, with fresh grief. We pray for all those who are in physical pain, that you would walk with them and lift that burden. We pray for those who are suffering from mental illness. That you would comfort them and calm them and send them the resources that they need to be whole again. We pray for those that society has rejected because of physical or mental disability. We pray for all those who have never been touched with care or met with compassion. We pray for those who are bound to rules and laws and those who oppress instead of bringing healing. May they be released from the fear, the anger, the uncertainty that drives them. We pray this morning for our teachers and our students as they begin their preparations for the new school year. We pray that our rekindling relationship with Brogdon would be a blessing for us as well as for them. May we see the needs that are right in front of us. We pray for our church for its leaders. We pray for this charge conference season as we uh, gather our reports and our stories of faithfulness over this past year and prepare for celebration. And we prepare for discernment as we go forward. We pray for this country and its leaders 
and for the leaders of all the nations around the world, that they may come under your influence as they guide their people. Lord of the Sabbath, we ask that you would lead us all into faithful living so that we may be unbowed and stand in righteousness before you, healed and whole as you created us to be. We pray now as Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please turn in your hymnals to 794 for the responsive reading, um, Psalm 71. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Your right mm -hmm. and me and 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 be to me a rock of refuge a strong fortress to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Rescue me, O oh my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of the ungodly. For you, O oh Lord, are my hope, my trust, O oh Lord, from my youth. I have been an example to many, for you are my strong refuge. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. Do not cast me off in the time of old age. Forsake me not when my strength is spent. For my enemies speak concerning me. Those who watch my life consult Together saying, God has forsaken him. Pursue and seize him, for there is no deliverer. O God, be not far from me. O my God, make haste to help me. Our gospel lesson comes from the book of uh, Luke, chapter 13. Verses 10 to 17. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, 
And just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had been crippled for 18 years. She was bent over and was unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. And when he laid his hands on her, immediately she uh, stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, there are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, and not on the Sabbath. But the Lord answered him, you hypocrites, does, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to get water? Are not this woman? a daughter of Abraham whom Satan bound for 18 long years be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonder, wonderful things that he was doing. The word of God for the people of God. Scripture passages for these next two weeks are stories of Jesus teaching and healing on the Sabbath. And that passage that Tommy just read for us helps us to get at the true meaning and purpose of Sabbath observance. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Personal urgency gets lost in bureaucracy. Personal urgency gets lost in bureaucracy. I heard that statement recently in a webinar for faith communities on climate change and what communities can do to become more resilient to the effects of climate change. One of the keynote speakers was Marquetta Goodwine a computer scientist and mathematician, as well as a cultural historian and an environmental actress and an, author, an activist, rather, and an author. She is known around the world as Queen Quet, the chiefess of the Gullah, Gullah Geechee Nation. The Gullah Geechee people are descendants of West Africans who were enslaved on the rice, indigo, and cotton plantations of the southern coast. And they've created a culture that deeply retains elements of African culture in their language and their arts and crafts and their food ways and in their music. And the name Gullah Geechee comes from the Creole language that they developed as a means of communicating among um, people in that time that were speaking many different African languages as well as the slaveholders English. And these Gullah Geechee people reside to this day in the coastal areas and the sea islands of the coastal U.S. from Jacksonville, North Carolina down to Jacksonville, Florida. Now in this webinar, Queen Quet spoke about how the way of life and the rich cultural heritage of the Gullah Geechee people and their actual lives and health are being threatened by the temperature extremes and the resulting droughts and storms that are becoming more and more frequent and dangerous because of climate change. She described how her people are dispersing to the mainland as more farms and homes are being destroyed and the co coastal ecosystem that the fishermen depend upon is being disrupted by these more and more frequent extreme weather events. On Sapelo Island, Georgia, which is the most intact of the Gullah Geechee communities, in just 20 years, the population has gone from over 1,000 to right around 20. 
And Queen Quet told how the low-lying coastal areas and islands where the Gullah Geechee people reside are the most vulnerable and the most affected, but they're often the last to receive help in times of disaster. And she shared how she has advocated for her people. She has spoken to the United Nations in Switzerland about the plight of the Gullah Geechee people. She's been all over the world telling her story. So she's advocated for her people, and especially her people there on the island of St. Helena, where she lives, uh, to get better maintenance of the mostly dirt roads, uh, get a reliable ferry service, and regular emergency services, not to mention disaster relief, for which they pay taxes just like everyone else. And in her conversations with FEMA and the other government officials, it became apparent that they weren't making their decisions about where to send resources based on actual observed levels of need. Their decisions were based on census data. And guess what? The census data for those remote areas without reliable ferry service and well-maintained roads did not reflect the actual population because the officials wouldn't go to the actual trouble of getting to those communities to collect the data. So Queen Quet explained to them how her people were dying and losing their livelihoods because they were following government guidelines instead of responding to real people's needs in real time. Our personal urgency gets lost in your bureaucracy. That's what she told those officials. In today's gospel lesson, the personal urgency of the woman bowed down by a crippling spirit for 18 years was also lost in bureaucracy. The synagogue leader was more concerned with following the rules of Sabbath observance than with the woman's well-being. The synagogue leader said, it's been 18 years, what's one more day? But Jesus cuts through the bureaucracy and says, it's been 18 years, don't let another day pass. So in violation of the Sabbath law, Jesus touches the woman and heals her. And the crippling spirit leaves her, and she stands up straight. How could the synagogue leader be so callous? Why did he object so strongly to that breach of protocol? Well, the synagogue leader is not an entirely unsympathetic figure. We have to remember that the Jewish leaders were operating in the midst of Roman oppression. The Roman authorities were keeping an eye on them, and the Jewish leaders in turn were keeping an eye on their people and exerting their religious authority to keep, keep them in line and to keep them from rebelling against the Roman oppression. So it was sort of an accommodation sort of thing going on there. These leaders were just trying to survive. And as any therapist, counselor, psychologist will tell you, in survival mode, anything can be perceived as a threat. Even an act of compassion that restored the life of one of his own people was perceived as a threat by that synagogue leader. So that leader was really more concerned with maintaining the status quo, with following the rules, with keeping folks in line and keeping the Roman authorities off his back than with celebrating a miracle of God. Protestant churches have become, in some cases, just as guilty of similar legalism. The early Christians celebrated the Sabbath on Sunday, on the first day of the week, instead of the seventh, as the Jewish community did. We did that to commemorate the resurrection. And then in 321 of the Common Era, the newly converted Roman Emperor Constantine mandated Sunday as a day of rest. It became a law. And that inaugurated a long period of governmentally enforced Sabbath observance and attendance at church. You had to be in church. And then later, when the Reformation swept through Europe in the 1500s, 1600s, it brought renewed emphasis on long, arduous worship services, which were devised partly in order to keep the people from the temptations of a day of rest, temptations like lust and gluttony. Keep them in church, they can't be tempted. And then American Protestantism upped the game. 
in the early days of our country. They increased the severity and duration of Sabbath obligations as evidence of deeper piety. But folks, we know that that kind of legalism misses the point of Sabbath. The point of Sabbath is delight in God and God's creation. And where the synagogue leader was focused on observing Sabbath rules, Jesus was observing true Sabbath. In the words of Wayne Muller, the author of a book titled Sabbath, on the seventh day, God finished God's work. God created tranquility, serenity, peace, and repose. Rest in the deepest sense of fertile, healing stillness. The Sabbath commandment, you'll recall, says, remember the Sabbath. Remember first that God rested from toil, and we are to imitate God, and remember that we were once bound and bent over by the oppression of Egypt until God freed us. So every Sabbath is like a little exodus when we are freed from toil. So the rhythm of Sabbath is the rhythm of salvation, and it's all for the sake of restoration, of health, both personal and familial, and societal. Sabbath rhythm is a rhythm of restoration, of salvation, of hope and healing for individuals, for families, and for societies. But as that synagogue leader demonstrates, the most holy of duties can be carried out in ways that subvert what God intends. So Jesus subverts this abuse and distortion of religious life and demonstrates true Sabbath. He demonstrates the true purpose of religious practice, fostering healthy and vibrant life. Again, Wayne Muller says, the God who made Sabbath is not a cranky schoolmaster, always forbidding something, coercing obedience, and overseeing cowardly compliance. The Sabbath commandment comes from a kind and wise teacher who does not like to see us suffer on Sunday or any other day. Now we have plenty of religious rule breakers in the Methodist tradition. We have plenty of people in our tradition who were willing and are willing to ignore bureaucracy and convention to meet an urgent personal need right in front of them. I could preach every Sunday for a year and still not name all the instances of such service and such uh, bravery, such spiritual courage. But one story I do remember um, and would like to share with you, I, I couldn't get my, find my way back to the original uh, source, but I, I do remember this story of um, Methodist women's groups in South Georgia back in the 20s and 30s. And I think back at that time it was called not United Methodist Women or whatever, it was called um, Women's Society of Christian Service, um, some, something like that. But at that place, at that time, it was unlawful for blacks and whites to mingle. But these Methodist women said, the heck with that. We are Christian women and we have work to do. And so they held joint meetings and conducted joint missions for the flourishing of their communities. And the sheriff came and tried to stop them, but he was no match for those Methodist women who saw a need right in front of them. We've had churches right here in Durham in recent years who saw a need right in front of them and opened their church as a sanctuary, as an asylum for refugees. We have churches right here in Durham and across the United Methodist Connection, across the world, who see the need right in front of them to acknowledge and accept the fact that LGBTQ people exist in this world 
and that they were created by God and called good by God, and that continued isolation of them is doing serious harm, and it needs to stop. See, the creation of bureaucracy and slow walking change is and always has been a tactic of oppression and control. We hear it in statements like, this, isn't ch this church isn't ready for a pastor of color. Or, this, church, this country isn't ready for a female president. Or we don't have the money right now for new schools in poor neighborhoods. We can't receive this refugee community right now. We just don't have the capacity. Or the census data shows that road repair, reliable ferry service, and emergency services aren't a priority for those people on that island. But friends, God is not bound by human conventions and constructs or by human greed or fear or anxiety or thirst for power or resistance to change. God notices what needs healing and calls it out. And God's vision and purposes are always more expansive than ours. And God will raise up prophets to tell us what God sees and what we are to do. Jesus shows us that God doesn't wait to act. That God doesn't delay in doing the right thing. Jesus heals in the here and now regardless of human concocted constraints. Jesus heals in the here and now in order to show love and compassion. Jesus stands against the self-righteousness of religious distortions. He straightens out our twisted interpretations and calls us to remember that Sabbath was made to unbind us, and to unbend us, and Jesus declares to us, as he declared to that woman in the scripture passage, that we are set free. But it's not true Sabbath if all can't participate. The healing of the bent over woman on the Sabbath reminds us that one person's rest cannot come at the expense of another's life and health. If we can't stand with God and call all the world God and see it flourishing as God created it to be, then there is more work for us to do. Let us pray. Dear God, forgive us when we let ourselves get too tired, too busy, too afraid, and too comfortable with the status quo to tend to the needs in front of us. Help us to see what you see and to use the freedom you give us by water and the spirit to participate in your healing work with the urgency it deserves. Amen. Our hymn of response is number 2087. I invite you to please stand in body or in spirit.
Christ join together in the historic confession of the Christian faith, the Apostles' Creed, as it's found on page 881 in your hymnals. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the resurrection. invite the ushers to come forward as we return to God, God's tithes in our offerings. Liberating God, each day you work untold miracles that are a testament of your love and your desire to make us whole. We offer to you these humble gifts, and we prayerfully ask that you bless them, multiply them, and use them to reach those urgently needing to experience the miracle of your love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I invite you to remain standing for our sending hymn, number 465.
and sisters, by our baptisms, God gives us the freedom to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in which, whatever forms it presents itself. So take that freedom. Go forth into the world this week. Notice the urgent needs that are right before you and use that freedom, that power that God gives you to touch and to heal. As you go, go in peace with the love of God, with the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the companionship of the Holy Spirit, now and forever.